So let me start, get started here. My name is Jeremy, for those that don't know me. Uh, my wife, Andrea, and I, we have been attending church here for many years since we were children. Uh, we have three daughters. We live right here in the town of Greece. And uh, that's my quick intro of me. Uh, I'm glad you're here. This is a topic that's very dear to us, my wife and I. Um, it's a, kind of a passion of ours to really get out into a community, our community, and the people that we just do life with on a day-to-day -day basis and try to show God's love and declare God's truth to them. And uh, th that's what we're talking about. If I could break this down into a little bit of a summary for you, what I'm trying to get across today is that we're out to um, intentionally establish friendships with people. Um, we are out to help others in need. We are lovingly declaring the truth, openly living a consistent reflection of Christ, and winning our neighbors to Christ. That's the mission, right? That's what we're here. We're talking about an evangelism conference, or we're at an evangelism conference. We're talking about evangelism. We're talking about declaring uh, the truth of God, the gospel, uh, repentance and remission of sins to people, and doing that with the people that we see uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Who is our neighbor? Who is your neighbor? A little open discussion here. Who is your neighbor? Coworkers. Coworkers. Yeah, this isn't just the person that lives next door to you. This is, these are the people that you see uh, in the coffee shop. It, it, and not necessarily like people that you walk by. I'm talking the people that you just generally, I call it do life with. You, you do life with them, yeah. Family is your neighbor too, yeah. Yeah. It's someone that you talk to regularly, maybe not every day, but you, you, as part of the routines of your life, these are the people that you interface with. Um, so I have a lot of examples. They may not fit your personal circumstances, but I, I, I draw some principles from those examples, and the principles should fit your circumstances or be able to be applied in your circumstances. And uh, so I've got some stories. Let me start with one. My wife and I, we've always cared about people. Uh, cared about the people that live next to us. Now, that doesn't come naturally to us, just like you. We're selfish. We kind of want things for ourselves. We don't want to be inconvenienced that much. We, um, you know, we, we want our rest. We want our time. We want our solitude. We, you know, we have kids, and we work jobs. and So there's that part of us that's, that's selfish and just says, I can't do this right now. I can't help. I can't. You know, We have to overcome that. But anyways, uh, I, I think that the compassion for people that we have really is the fruit of the Spirit worked out in our life, right? And so the compassion that we have in our lives is God's work in our life. Um, after my second daughter was born, we were, we were still living in a townhouse. And it was a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon. I remember being home. I think I was laying on the couch, and Andrea was upstairs. And a, a baby was sleeping. I think even my older daughter was sleeping. And all of a sudden, we heard thud on the side of the house. I'm like, oh, what's going on? Thought again, thought again. My wife, of course, you know, Jerry, they're going to wake up the baby. Stop. So I, I, I go outside, and there's six or seven little kids. They're playing football, and our wall was the end zone. So when they caught the ball, they hit the house. When they missed the ball, the ball hit the house. So either way, like, the house was getting, getting nailed. It was just like it was over and over again. So I walk out there. I'm like, hey, guys, you know, we just had a baby. My wife's really tired. I explained it to them. And how many of you know that, that uh, six to ten-year-olds, they, they, they really feel empathy for your circumstances? <laughs> they, not so much. They, within minutes of going back inside, thud on the house. What would you do? Yeah, that's what I did. I went outside. I was like, all right, I guess I'm not getting any rest today. I went outside. I rerouted the field of play. I said, we're going to play this way. And I'm the all-time QB. Let's go, guys. But, you know, a simple example of how do you handle a confrontation with people that you live next to that you're going to have to wake up and see the next day. And how, how are you going to do that? How are you going to show love? Interesting thing is um, one day my wife and I were home, and one of those kids comes up to our door and knocks on the door. And Andrew answers the door, and he's like, do you have any food? And I think he specifically asked for fruit. And my wife kind of stopped and was like, okay, well, yeah, we do. 
Come to find out this family, there were six or seven of them, all, all six or seven were living in one two-bedroom townhome with one single parent. Now, they weren't all siblings, but they were, some of them were, were siblings, some of them were cousins. And we also learned that they were relocated because of Hurricane Katrina to Rochester. I don't know how they ended up in Rochester, but that's, that's their story. And here they are right in front of us. And you know, here, right in front of my wife, is this little boy who's hungry. And so she asks him, she says, you know, what, he, what have you had to eat today? And I think he said, like, dry Raymond Joel soup, drag and dog, and eat it. And that's nothing. It's not food for a growing eight-year-old, nine-year-old boy. So we gave him something to eat. But then the other thing we did is that we, we invited him over for a cookout. We said, hey, do you guys want to come over and do a cookout with us and, you know, have some watermelon and stuff? And, of course, they're like, yeah, sure. So all the kids come over, but not the mom. So we, we had our cookout. We managed the kids. It was really fun. Um, but it was hard work, and we sent them home with a plate for their mom, too, because uh, we hadn't really seen her that much. They didn't stay where they lived long. They, being a, you know, kind of on government program there, they were being relocated. I think it wasn't a few weeks later that they were packing up their house, and they were getting ready to leave, and I saw the mom out front, so I went over to talk to her, and she opened up. She expressed her fear and her worry for their circumstances, for her kids, for what she was going to do. I mean, imagine the, the circumstances that she's in. And I, in return, was able to express God's care and love for her. And I, I remember praying with her and for her. And my wife, she had made little goodie bags for the kids. And so we, she took the bags out and handed them out to all the kids. And uh, it was a, a small way in which we were able to just show God's love and care and have an opportunity to testify of who God is and you know, pray for someone and see where that, that seed planted would go in their life. I don't remember their names. I don't remember their faces. But what I remember, and the point that I want you to stick with you is that it was up to me to do something. I saw a need, and it was up to me to do something. This wasn't the government's responsibility to help them. This wasn't, um, you know, I can't blame the, the dad. Where's the dad? I can't blame mismanagement of the money. I saw a need in front of me, and I have to do something about it. That's compassion. That's the work of God. To walk away from a situation like that where you see a need is to compromise what you believe on so many levels. So where I want to start today is... Uh, Understanding our purpose and identity in Christ. We know the command to love thy neighbor. John wrote that uh, whoso hath this world's goods and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwells the love of God in him? You ever find yourself there? I'm too busy. I don't really have enough. Well, we were we had two kids. My wife was exhausted. You do it because of the love of God. Um how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. We love, and that love is expressed in action. As a believer, God's purpose for us is to, be, is to act on behalf of his kingdom. We are called new creatures in Christ Jesus, called ministers of reconciliation. He created us unto good works, and we are supposed to be zealous of good works. And he says that we're supposed to be careful to maintain them, careful to maintain good works. Those good works include bringing forth personal fruit in your life. They include the great ministry that we have to one another, to edify, to teach, to rebuke and exhort and encourage, like the ministry to the church and each other. Those good works include taking care of the poor, the fatherless, and the widows, and certainly those good works, and what we're focused on here in our, our evangelism conference, include taking the love of God, to people that have never experienced him, to people who know nothing about him, to people who are bitter toward him, taking that love and the truth of the gospel message and bringing it to them in a way that they understand, not compromising the message, but bringing it to them in a way that they understand it. It's part of our purpose and identity. It makes us an ambassador or an agent of God in this world. The message of reconciliation. It's in this generation's hands to do something with. Just generation, I mean, 
So that's kind of our, our word right now, this generation now. This generation is everyone from the age where you can understandingly declare it to the age where uh, you, you're senile and you can't declare it anymore, okay? We got, the, we got the window. This generation, this is us. The word of reconciliation is in our hands. And it should be in more than just our hands. It should be in our minds and our hearts every day and everywhere we go in every set of circumstances. It's not Sunday. It's not Wednesday night. It's, it's Friday afternoon. It's Monday morning. The word of reconciliation is our identity. Got it? Identity. That's our purpose is what drives us. It's one of the things that establishes every decision that we make is based on our purpose and our identity. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Will this influence someone for Christ? Will this offend a brother? Will this, like that is how we make our decisions. So we bear this everywhere we go. A couple of points about this. A couple of points about our identity. There's no room for indifference. Indifference says it doesn't matter. Indifference says this is irrelevant. Indifference says why should I care? Indifference says somebody else is going to have to do this. Indifference is wrong. Indifference leads to no church. Indifference leads to no Bible study. Indifference leads to no life group leads to no great work of God in your life, no great work of God in the lives of the people around you. What do we need to do? If there's indifference in your life this morning, um, you know, maybe, I don't know everyone's circumstances, but I want, I, want to, I want to categorize something here and say that we need to break free from idols. What are, what, what are the main focuses of our day in, in America? This generation of Americans what are the focus for them? There's technology. Oh, man. Yeah, pleasure, right? Wealth. Yeah. How about amusement? Just do something. You know, I, I don't want to do anything. Do something for me. I just want to sit back and take it in. Uh, how about health? None of these things are wrong, okay? I'm not saying, like, a pursuit of health is wrong. You should, be, you should be living a healthy lifestyle, okay? I'm not saying pursuing wealth is wrong. You should be pursuing a uh, stable means of living, all right? But what I'm saying is that Americans pursue these things in excess. Our leisure, it becomes a focus. Time of amusement and entertainment, it becomes a focus for us, and we're driven after it. And the scripture teaches, well, let me say this. What do all of those things have in common? Self. So let's point it out right now. The idol of our age, the one that we all have to be consistently aware of and break free of, is the idol of self. That idol of self, we're going to put him right out here in front. He's, he's the one I need to be careful of. He's the one I need to say, okay, is this about me or is this about the Lord Jesus Christ? Have I taken the, the maintenance part of my life that is supposed to be important and made it wrong by an excessive obsession with it. Because when that happens, what the Bible teaches is that iniquity, when iniquity abounds, love goes cold. And what we're talking about here is loving people, caring to share. And, it, and if, if there's no care in you right now, or if, it, if it's getting cold, what I want to say is stop and examine if there's an idol, if there's iniquity in your life. And because what happens is when we stop loving, we stop caring. When we stop caring, we become selfish. We get stubborn. And we make life about taking what we can get instead of giving what we receive. And you would agree with me that Christ has called us to give what we've received. And we take love, we share love. We take grace, we share grace. We take truth, we share truth. So, I, I guess just to pause before we get into this, we have purpose and identity, and maybe at some point today, there's a time of repentance for you. There's a time to say, you know what, a time of reflection that just says, yeah, man, things have been getting cold in my life. I need to, I need to take care of some things. Andrew and I moved into our house in 2008. As first-time homeowners, we knew exactly what to expect. Not, not. 
We knew taxes, and we, we knew that there would be taxes. We knew that there would be taxes. <laughs> and more taxes. <laughs> Increasing, yeah, stop. Increased responsibilities, right, a home. We'd have neighbors. We, we knew all those cool things. We wanted to move in, enjoy our new place. We wanted to fly under the radar in the neighborhood. What that was going to take was mowing my lawn, not letting the grass get up to your you know, mid-calf level. That was going to take killing the weeds, because no one wants weeds in their neighbor's lawn if they're out there taking care of theirs. That meant not being out too late, not making too much noise. That, you know, like all those good neighboring skills, right? Being secluded from everyone, being quiet. Those are not good neighboring skills. We're going to find out. So one evening, right after we moved in, um, I'm finishing up working on our roof for the day. A police car shows up in front of the house, and I'm like, oh, what's going on? I walk down. He informs me that my, one of my neighbors had called the cops on me because they were concerned that we were being too loud, and their kids had to go to bed. And I thought, it's 8.30 at night. Like, it's not even dark out yet. It's, you know, it's June. School's almost done. They probably have a half day tomorrow. You know, I'm, like, all this stuff is going through my head. Like, what is going on? I'm serious. Cop car comes up. They, they had called the police on me because I was trying to fix my house. Well... I wasn't happy about that. Complimentary story to this one. And the house adjacent to us, uh, i.e. my wife and I can look out our side window of our bedroom and see down that house, they had large gatherings on the weekend where there was um, loud music, where there was cheap beer, and very late nights, 2 a.m. nights. You know, this neighbor didn't call the cops on them. We didn't have, call the cops on them. We had little kids. We're trying to sleep. We get up to go to church on Sunday. Didn't they know? Well, uh, I guess what we learned is that it's okay on weekends, but it's not okay on a Thursday night. <laughs> we had a very nice backyard for our house. We have arborvitaes lining the back. It's very nice, it's secluded and private. Uh, great for the kids. We set up a grill on the back patio. We set up a, a table and chairs back there. And in general, we spent most of our time back there. Other than the occasional late-night weekend party and the police incident, um, moving in it was actually a really good neighborhood. And it was pretty quiet. And like most suburban neighborhoods, if you live in one, uh, people come home from work, they park in their driveway or their garage, and they go in their house. And you wave hello to them, and you see them mow their lawn, and that's it. So some changes. We... We eventually got to know our neighbors, uh, casually. I don't have any dates or anything like that, but you learn their names, you, get, you, know, you exchange contact information, and you engage in small talk about lawn care and you know, projects that you're doing around the house. And we even noticed that some of them had started hanging out together on their own on the weekends, not just the, the party next door, but just some different gatherings of different neighbors. And Andrew and I, we wanted to be friends, but we're kind of like, how do we... How do we just do we just jump in? Do you just go over to someone's house? Do you wait to be invited? We didn't really, we didn't really know. So, um, not being invited, we kind of just did our own thing, and uh, kept to ourselves. So, there came a point where we were sitting outside in our front, and one of the neighbors was like, "You know, hey, you guys, you guys want to come over and hang out with us?" And of course, we were, we accepted that, and we've been friends with them. We've developed a friendship. Uh, from that time, and one of the, the thing I want to address here is that I've never asked them what their perspective of us was during that time. Our perspective of them, kind of know, uh, you know, the late night, the drinking, and stuff like that. They're really good people. They're nice and friendly, uh, but sometimes people perceive a Christian to be some religious person all about making other people conform to their standards, right? Well, you should be going to church. There's all these outward, external things we place on people. And when it comes to the mission that we're going to about, about to accomplish, we need to accomplish it the way Jesus did. So that's not in conformity to externals. That is a life change internally, is what Jesus did. I think a lot of people have the perspective that um, Christians aren't going to hang out with people who drink and smoke, that maybe Christians are just, you know, crazy. Have you, ever, have you ever examined your life and maybe you got to, you've, you've seen, you've got to a point where your schedule is, I go to church, I go to work. There's two places that you go. 
And then if you're not going to one of those two places, and the grocery store, right? Uh, and if you're not going to one of those places, you're in your home or in your backyard. It's kind of the way we were, my wife and I. I think another, uh, an, another thing that, that stands out is um, people think we're judgmental, that, that the first thing we're ever going to do is talk to them about their lifestyle, again, conforming to externals. Those are cultural barriers that we've put up ourselves over the years. I didn't do it personally, but there's just the general perspective of you guys do this and we do this. Um, Sometimes we have a perspective that uh, we are out to make people's lives happy, healthy, and productive. Like, you know, the, the gospel does that, right? So we're going to bring truth to them and help them in their life. But that's not what Jesus died for. That's not the mission that we're out to do. We can't take someone to the good results of living a life by grace through faith without first taking them to the cross and acknowledging sin and, and repentance and then a belief in a resurrected Savior. So that's called being born again. Uh, we believe that a new life comes from a new life, a new lifestyle comes from having a new life. So the point here is don't trample under your feet the cross of Christ because you want to be nice to people. We still have to bring the truth. And uh, but just how, how do you get there, right? How do you bring that truth to people? One of the things that Andrew and I learned is that to fulfill the mission as Jesus did, we needed to cross what I call the cultural barrier. And what I want to point out here is that the cultural barrier is really in place because of the religious system, not because the culture has put up a barrier. It's our barrier that we need to cross. Uh, example, Jesus and the woman at the well. Jesus, you're not supposed to talk to Samaritans. You're not supposed to talk to women. Where did those rules come from? Pharisees. Uh, Jesus and Zacchaeus, a uh, tax collector. Jesus, you're not supposed to associate with you know, traitors, the Jews who are Roman tax collectors. And Jesus, you're not supposed to have dinner with people who are sinners. Um, Jesus, healing people on the Sabbath day. Don't you know you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day? Yeah, shame on you, Jesus. I hope you're getting the point that the cultural barrier Jesus had to cross was placed there by the religious system. And my point is that we need to do the same thing. This isn't casting off belief, obviously. This isn't casting off moral truth. This is casting off, I guess, or crossing over the, let me read what I wrote down so I don't say it wrong. Um, th this is casting off, I guess, the, the expectations that you perceive to be in place on your life because of a religious system or because of belief. There's many barriers. They're the result of years of Christians withdrawing themselves from normal day-to-day -day life. We have. We've withdrawn ourselves from just day-to-day -day things, softball leagues, um, you know, the, the different things that people gather together to do that are fun. We've kind of said, oh, we're not, we're not going to do that, or we've created our own over here so that we've made a separation. Um, how about this? There's a, a, a political divide, right? Where now there's a barrier that's a political and a social expectation attached to Christians. We didn't make this one. This just happened. We vote on a statistical conservative line, so now we're attached to words like fundamentalist, right-wing, and conservative. We have to cross that barrier. The question is, other than work, what do you participate in that is not a church-organized function? And what do you participate in that does not involve an attendance that is majority Christian? What do you do where you go in, into the world and sit among sinners and love and declare the truth? So I've got two points, two things that Andrew and I have learned. Uh, uh, with this key thought, be authentic and consistent. So two thoughts that Andrew and I have learned, and I need to jump through this pretty quick. One, crossing the barrier. Crossing the barrier requires being adaptable. Adaptability 
I'm defining as a willingness to adjust your personal habits, to change your lifestyle, to alter your routines, and to set aside your preferences. My wife and I, in, in our neighborhood, after kind of making friends with people, we um, went to sort of going to kids' birthday parties. We started hanging out with them at night. We went to Christmas parties. We went to the Halloween and the New Year's parties. We just started doing life with them. And um, one of the things that was so influential in my life and in theirs was late night campfires. Someone's got a fire going, they're going to sit outside at night, and you can just go out and join them. Go sit out and be like, hey, we're having a fire. Or you put the fire in your front yard, and when the town of Greece comes, you, you put a thing over and put some hot dogs on it and tell them you're cooking, you know? <laughs> I'm just cooking. What this requires, though, is that you know the moral line of what the Bible teaches, of what is truly right and wrong, according to Christ. And number two, that you understand the principles of Christian liberty. What, you know, how far can you go to minister to someone? Paul said that to the, the Jew, he became a Jew. To the Greek, he became a Greek. Or to, to them that are under the law, he became as those that are under the law. To the weak, he became weak. Uh, adapt, this adaptability, one of the points I want to make here is that two main things that we did, we lived our life in our front yard was one of our adaptations. Nothing wrong with that, is there? It's n- kind of not socially acceptable. Like, it's just not what people do. But you leave your car out of your driveway, you leave the garage door open, and you place yourself in your front yard. Kids, we're going to go play in the front. Set chairs out there. Grill in your front yard. Grill it out in front of your, your driveway. One of our neighbors had done that for a long time. The reason he did it was because he had a small backyard. The reason we did it is because we wanted to meet people. Um, Another adaptation we made was how we communicated our faith. Our late-night conversations around the the campfire, when things became spiritual, I learned that there were words and phrases that you just can't use with people who have never opened a Bible and who have never been to a church. Uh, For example, I couldn't say in the book of Isaiah. What What do you mean the book? We thought the Bible was one big thing. And what do you mean, I, what's an Isaiah? Is that a person or is that, a, like, is that a, a location? So I would have to change the way I talk. And I, and I would say things like, there, there was a writer who's included in the collection of documents in the Bible. His name was Isaiah and he was a prophet. It takes a lot more to say that, but that's how it has to be said because they don't understand. They've never had, like they didn't grow up like I grew up. They haven't been in church. Here's another one. I couldn't say Paul. I couldn't use the word apostle. I couldn't use the word crucified. Like this is all a completely, what I understood, what what I came and what Andrew and I came to understand was this is a completely different language that we speak here in church. And we had to take it, we had to take the words that we use so commonly and reword them, adapt them to the culture. So it wasn't the apostle It was, you know, there was a, one of the original followers of Jesus Christ who had a personal, like a personal relationship with Jesus and a personal, like, uh, mission on their life. This guy's name was Paul. Oh, oh, Paul. Okay, I got it. Person, follow Christ, you know, kind of special guy. All that stuff, all those words that we use, redemption. Um, Hey, words like sacrifice. They don't know that there were animal sacrifices. Shed blood. How gross, what is this, like, what is this Bible? This is like vampires, like, what is going on? You know, you, you can't, like, think about what you're saying in terms of someone who's never heard it. It's fresh to them. So how, how are you going to explain it? Communicate with words and phrases that people will understand. Thought, live out front. Mike, how much time do I have? Okay. You know, we are stewards in this generation of the eternal truth. We have the privilege of handling, reading, and speaking God's words. As long as we are declaring the truth as it is written, there is no prescribed way to say it, right? We declare the truth. There's no prescribed way to say it. Don't get stuck in the rut of saying it the same way because it's just the way we, you know, we commonly say it. No, think outside the box and think, how can I say this so that they will understand it? 
Crossing the barriers requires availability. So availability, I'm saying, is to be visible and available. And obviously, this requires time. It's going to be inconvenient, and it demands sacrifice, and it includes helping others. At some point in our, in our neighborhood, uh, we were, were casual acquaintances with people. We're kind of hanging out. One of our neighbors was working on his roof. He was actually cleaning out his gutters. He's on a ladder, and he fell off his ladder. And a couple of the guys were there. They um, called 911. My wife heard him scream, runs over to help. Of course, the ambulance, fire trucks show up. But how many of you know that when the ambulance and fire trucks show up, everyone within sight of flashing lights is out the front door? Right? And they are, you're there. And you can kind of walk around and say hi to people and explain what happened. And Andrea was like on the scene helping them. She's a nurse. So what had happened is, as a group of neighbors, knowing that he was not, he was going to be down for a while. He broke his leg, fractured his spine. And he's healthy now. In fact, he attends church here now, Chris does. His name's Chris. And we knew he was going to be down, wasn't going to be able to mow his lawn. So we got together as a group of neighbors and said, hey, we're going to, we're going to help him. We're going to mow his lawn. So I remember getting done mowing my lawn one night. You know, after work, I'm tired. I got my lawn done. And I'm thinking, now's the night to go. I got to go mow his lawn. Go in and tell my wife. I'm going down the road. I'm going to mow Chris's lawn. I walk down there. I start my mower up. I hadn't made two passes on his lawn, and two other neighbors were out mowing his lawn. I don't think I mowed Chris's lawn another time that summer. I couldn't get to it. It was already done by my neighbors. One of the things I learned is that they put me to shame when it came to loving people. There are people out there that don't have the love of God shed abroad in their hearts, and they love better than I do. Puts me to shame. They care. Just recently, one of my neighbors, um, had, their lawn, I don't know them that well. It's, it's an older woman that lives up the road, but her grass was getting like this. So I, I had driven by, and I'm like, you know, somebody, doesn't she have any family? Somebody needs to do something about this. What does my neighbor do? My neighbor goes, yeah, my neighbor just gets on his riding lawnmower, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to go over there and mow it. <laughs> oh, I'm ashamed of myself. Availability. It requires availability. And what are the things that keep us from being available? We've got a schedule. We have a set of routines that we're not willing to waver from. Look over the stories of Jesus and consider the time he spent around people. What was he doing? Ministering to people. Healing. There was always people around him. He was, for the most part, available. American culture, again, its influence on us tells us that to be productive and useful members, we need to be doing something for the economy, for the environment, and for society. I think that mentality has permeated Christianity in our culture. It, it just happens. The culture is always sort of bearing in on Christianity, but Christianity should always, our belief should always be bearing back on the culture. So, you know, we have to be available and visitor, or visible. We said that we were created to do good work. And Don mentioned in the first session that we're supposed to like let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let me point out the obvious here. If people are going to see your good works, you have to be visible to them. And I think a lot of times we're frantically doing something, we're busy, we're doing a good work, but we're not visible. No one's going to glorify God. Another thing is, you have to be available if you're going to have meaningful conversations with people. Campfires, going out late at night, that wasn't our lifestyle. That wasn't what we did. We, I, I, I'm a regimented, routine individual. I go to bed at 10, I wake up at 5.30. This is what I do. So Friday night, when we're like, hey, let's go hang out. All right, let's go. We're going to stay out till 1 o'clock. Okay, let's do it. But my point is this. No meaningful communication, no true relationship. Establish a relationship, you've got to have that communication. My last point here is no true relationship equals no influence. It starts with availability. You've got to free up some time. You have to intentionally free up time in your schedule and intentionally make yourself available. And that may require going out front 
on your front step, sitting in a chair, and doing nothing, and reading a book, letting, just, just being there. And you know what? People kind of walk over and they say hello. Like, hey, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm so-and-so. Maybe even a friendship gets, a friendship that you currently have, you're able to establish that even better. The result of all of this is um, that we were able to start a Bible study in our neighborhood with our neighbors. In December of 2013, Kevin Petsky was in town. He preached a message on hell on a Sunday morning. And I remember sitting there and thinking that I, I love these people, my neighbors. We've been hanging out with them for a couple of years now. And I remember I, I came home and I talked to Andrew and I said, what else can we do? And we had been doing a life group in our home and we were kind of in between sessions at that time. So we said, hey, let's cancel our life group and let's do a Bible study. Canceling your life group is not something you want to do. Uh, you know, it's kind of frowned upon. Just, we need host homes. People are looking for host homes. We need host homes. We need teachers. Like, you ever get, like, I'm not, I'm kind of poking fun at it because it's, again, it's one of those perceived things. It's perceived. No one gave me a hard time. They said, that's awesome. Go do it. But perceived, you kind of stand back and you're like, oh, I got I to gotta tell you know, so-and-so that I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this next session. They're going to, yeah, they're going to, yeah. They're going to, I'm going to get points dung off the, is that what you said, dinged off the Christian chart? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. No one's going to vote for me as a deacon. Gas. But. What ha- you know, what happened is that was a perceived thing. Remember, adaptability, the perceived things. They're not, always, they're not always real. They're what you perceive to be, the Christian code of conduct. I have to be involved in this thing. I have to do this. No, you don't. So what we did is we, we canceled that life group. We invited our neighbors. I sent them a big message. I'm like, hey, if you're willing to come, come. Five, all of them showed up. It was five families. They all came. We went. We have, uh, have done a year and a half of Bible study. With them, we went completely through the Bible. We did, we did 21 lessons on the Bible overview. I used Bill's big picture Bible study. I kind of morphed it. Remember, I had to adapt it. I had to change the, the, the words of it and make it so that I could explain. I couldn't just say Moses. I couldn't just say the Ten Commandments. Like, well, what are those things? People had never, they honestly had never opened a Bible, some of them. So we've done that. And that is the work of God in our neighborhood. No, some of them, they, they were mixed. So they were mixed. And a lot of them, even though they may have like grown up in a, in a home that went to church, a lot of their understanding of it was, was formed by like the History Channel and a lot, of, you know, a lot of things that draw mystery. So, Make yourself available is the key thought there. And it takes intentionally doing something. So again... Art of neighboring, intentionally establishing friendships, helping others in needs, lovingly declaring the truth, openly living a consistent reflection of Christ in your life, and winning our neighbors to Christ. That's our purpose. That is our identity. That is, again, our calling as Christians to go and do this.